Well, I thought we'd start the morning off with something to uh, get us smiling, and uh, the band certainly got you woke up, I think. If you're not awake by now, there's not anything else I can do, right? But um, looking forward to a great week of Thanksgiving. Um, uh, you know, it's cliche almost to say, well, every day should be a day of Thanksgiving, and it's true. It should be, but so many times we get caught up in the the race of life, and we, uh, we forget to take time and pause. And so um, we're going to do that this Tuesday night. We're going to take time to pause on our main campus. We're going to have communion. If you would like to uh, partake in the Lord's Supper with uh, the body of believers, not just folks here, but um, your brothers and sisters over on our main campus, we're going to do that at 7 o'clock on Tuesday night. Um, it's going to be a great time together, so I encourage you to come out. Uh, for that. We're going to be in Luke chapter 17 this morning. If you have your Bibles, if you don't, there's Bibles under the chairs in front of you, or at least in fr under the chair, some of the chairs in front of you. Um, so you can take that out, turn to Luke 17. You've got an outline in your program that also has it if you don't happen to have your Bible. And um, we're going to take a look at um, a, a story about Thanksgiving, maybe a little different than what we've looked at in the past, but uh, I'll just start out with a, a story from a book that I, I read. Um, Greg Anders uh, there's an author named Greg Anders, and he wrote a book uh, titled Life on Purpose. And in it, he tells a story about a man whose wife had left him. Doesn't sound like anything to be too thankful for, right? But um, so he writes this story about a man whose wife had left him, and the man was completely depressed. He had lost faith in himself. He had lost faith in people. He had lost faith in God, and really was finding no joy in anything in life. So Anders writes that one rainy morning, this man went to a small neighborhood restaurant for breakfast. Although several people were at the diner, no one was speaking to anyone else. Our miserable friend, he writes, hunched over the counter, stirring his coffee with a spoon. In one of the small booths along the window was a young mother with a little girl. They had just been served their food when the little girl broke the sad silence by almost shouting, Mama, why don't we say our prayers right here? The waitress who had just served their breakfast turned around and said, Sure, honey, we can pray here. Will you say the prayer for us? And the little girl said, Sure. And so she turned and she looked at the rest of the people in the restaurant and she looked at all of them and she said, Bow your heads, right? <laughs> kids can get away with that kind of thing. You imagine if one of us went into a restaurant and said, Bow your heads, but kids get away with that. Surprisingly, one by one, the heads all started to go down. The little girl then bowed her head, folded her hands, and said, God is great, God is good, and we thank him for our food. And she said, amen. And Anders writes that the prayer changed the entire atmosphere. People began to talk with one another. The waitress even commented and said, we should do that every morning, amen? All of a sudden, said our friend, my whole frame of mind, the guy whose wife had left him, he said, my whole frame of mind started to improve. From that little girl's example, I started to thank God, he said, for all that I did have, and I stopped majoring on all that I didn't have. He said, in that moment, I started to be grateful. You know, we all understand and appreciate the importance of gratitude, how it radically changes relationships. In fact, one of the first things that we're taught one of the first things that, that we do with our children is we teach them to express their gratitude, right? Somebody, uh, we did this with our kids. We still do it with our kids, and we do it with our 18-year-old. Somebody gives them something, and we say, what do you say? And they say, thank you, right? Or hopefully they say, thank you, um, instead of, well, I deserve that, or I wanted that, which a lot of kids start to say now th these days. But we teach them gratitude from an early age. And, and I'll take my kids someplace, and I'll, if I take them out to dinner, when we leave, I wait to see if they're going to tell, tell, tell me thank you. You know, taking five kids out isn't cheap. So by the time I've spent 60 or $70 taking them out, I want to know if it matters, because if it doesn't, I'll sit at home and cook them hot dogs. I don't care, right? <laughs> so from an early age, we teach our children to say thank you, to show gratitude, to be thankful for things. And certainly, we all know as adults that we appreciate being thanked. Yet when it comes to giving thanks to God, our Heavenly Father, we so often miss the mark, don't we? Now, let me share another story with you this morning from Luke chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 11. Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 11. It's the story of the ten lepers. Some of you may have heard it before, some of you maybe not. But it says this, starting in verse 11, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. 
they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. They were desperate. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Verse 17, Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Verse 18, Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go, your faith has made you well. So let's go back to verse 12 for just a minute. The story begins, it says, As he was going into the village, ten men who had leprosy met him, and they stood at a distance. Listen, don't ever think for a moment that death is the worst thing that can happen to a person. It's not. And the scene this morning is a case in point. These ten men walked the earth. They breathed and ate. They had hopes and they had fears. They had aspirations and they had feelings just like you and I have. Yet there was a tragic sense in which they were already dead. Lepre they, they, were like the, they were like the walking dead, if you will, because they had this skin condition, condition. Listen, leprosy was the most dreaded of all ancient diseases. It ate away at the body and left its victim maimed and disfigured. There was no known cure. In their hopes for family life, a useful occupation, plans for their future, they were, they were dead men. They couldn't do anything. And their situation was made even worse by the leprosy because the leprosy was believed to be highly contagious. People thought that if you got anywhere near a leper, that you would, you would catch what they had. Actually, we know today that it's not, but, but it's hard to tell that to ancient superstition, right? The scripture made it quite clear that as the lepers approached Jesus, they stood at a far distance. Jewish law actually prescribed how far they had to stand away. Jewish law actually said that you couldn't get, if you were a leper, you couldn't get within 50 yards of a clean person. So 150 feet, you had to keep your distance. Everywhere these poor men journeyed, they heard those familiar words yelled out, unclean, leper, get out of the way. And then some would hurl stones at them oftentimes, to keep them away. Leprosy was a serious public health concern, but it was tinged with religious elements of ritual uncleanliness. So they not only had to live with their physical handicapped, handicap, but they were also isolated. They had to live in loneliness. And many times, loneliness, that can do more to drain a person's energy than living th with the most horrible diseases in life. No one wants to be lonely, right? But even in the midst of their horrible situation, these lepers had something to be thankful for. In their common misery, they had banded together. They had come together. They had found each other. And it's interesting to note that one of these ten lepers was a Samaritan, so he didn't even belong with the others, really. Now, a good Jew in that day would have no dealings with a Samaritan. We've talked about that before. They didn't mix they were enemies. They didn't care for each other. They looked upon the Samaritans. The Jews looked upon the Samaritans as dogs, as half-breeds. Yet in their common misery uh, of their leprosy, these men had forgotten that they were Jew and Samaritan, and they realized that they, they were men in need together. Some might say, well, it was a case of misery love, loves company. Well, well, maybe. That might be true. But I know that there is power in fellowship, especially the fellowship of people who have a common need. You know that when you meet people that have a common shared interest or a common need. You find, find that commonality, and then there's this, there's this fellowship that happens. Which brings me to the first point of the story, and it's on your outline as well, which is simply this. Even in the midst of our problems, there is always something to be thankful for. Even in the midst of our problems, there is always... Not sometimes, that blank isn't sometimes, that blank isn't most of the time, that blank is always, there's always something to be thankful for. Some of you may be thinking, well, you know what, Pastor, that's easy for you to say because you just don't know what I'm going through right now. You don't know the problems I have. You don't know what circumstance I'm facing. You don't know what I'm dealing with right now. And sometimes we look at the state of our nation and we think, man, there's not much to be thankful for here in our country either. Listen, I can't deny the reality of the problems that exist. In many cases, very deep and troubling pains and sorrows. But friends, listen, 
There is no one sitting here this morning that has it worse than these 10 guys did in Luke chapter 17. Their skin was peeling open. Sometimes it was falling off. They had lost their families. They had lost their friends. They had lost the privilege of worshiping at the temple. And for a Jew, that was critical because that was the way that you connected with God. That's how you got close to God, was going to the temple and offering your sacrifices. And they had lost that privilege, which means they were separated from God by the religious standard of that day. They were completely separated from society, yet they had something to be thankful for. Have you ever wondered what that first pilgrim's uh, Thanksgiving, what, what in the world they had to be thankful for? You know, we, we see that picture in our mind. That there's a famous portrait of the pilgrims sitting down with the Indians, and there's piles of food on the table. And, and you know, the reality is, is it doesn't adequately tell the story. The first Thanksgiving the pilgrims had, they found that half of their numbers were dead. Half of their people had died. They didn't come close to having even the smallest of comforts that we enjoy today. They were men and women without a land. Yet in the midst of all of that, there was a gratitude that they showed to God. The Pilgrim's Thanksgiving was not the mat for the materialistic things in life. They weren't, thank you for my iPhone, and thank you for my laptop, and thank you, you know, thank you for my semi-automatic, or whatever it was, you know. <laughs> Muskets weren't very effective in those days, right? Okay, so listen. It wasn't a materialistic thing. The Pilgrim's Thanksgiving was one of hope and one of faith. And it was that same sense of hope and of faith that enabled the Apostle Paul to sit in a dingy prison cell and write from Ephesians chapter 5, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. He's sitting in a prison cell. Rats running around, water running down, can't stay dry, can't stay clean, hardly being fed. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, he doesn't say, well, I'll give thanks when I'm out of this prison cell. He says, always giving thanks. But so often we get busy and we forget that and we find ourselves fussing and texting about all the things that didn't go right and all the things that we're upset about or calling our friend and saying this didn't go right or that didn't go right. Paul says, always giving thanks. Daniel Defoe wrote a famous, ficti uh, ficti I can't talk today, fictional book, uh, fictitious book uh, called Robinson Crusoe, right? And he has this character called Robinson Crusoe, and the first thing that he did, when he gets shipwrecked on the island, some of you know this story, he gets shipwrecked on an island, and he, he's deserted, there. he's the only person there, so the first thing that he does is he sits down to make a list. Now, if I'm wrecked on an island, I'm not making a list. I'm looking for food, I'm trying to figure out how I'm getting off. This guy sits down and he makes a list, and on the one side, he wrote down all of his problems, and on the other side, he wrote down all of his blessings. And on one side, he wrote down, I do not have any clothes. That's a problem, at least in our eyes, right? On the other side, he writes, but it is warm, and I really don't need any. On one side, he wrote, all of the provisions were lost in the wreck. On the other side, he wrote, but there's plenty of fresh fruit and water on the island. And down the list he went. So in this fashion, he discovered that for every negative aspect about his situation that he found himself in in that moment, there was a positive aspect or something that he could find to be thankful for. It's easy to find ourselves on an island of despair when those troubles pop up, when our car breaks down, when things don't go the way that we think they should, when, when somebody attacks us unfairly. It's easy to find ourselves on that island of despair, but maybe this Thanksgiving we should sit down and we should take inventory of our blessings instead of being distracted by the things that we don't have. These men had lost everything in Luke 17, yet they were thankful for having each other. They had banded together and had found common fellowship and, and, and at least had companionship. Even in the middle of suffering, reasons can be found to give thanks that's the first lesson, but we can't stop there. Finding reasons to be grateful is good. But the second lesson of the story on your outline there is in the midst of problems, thanksgiving needs to be expressed. In the midst of our problems, our thanksgiving needs to be expressed. It says in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with what? Thanksgiving. Present your request to God. 
And then what happens? Look at this. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It says, when you, when you pray to God, when you bring your petitions to God with thanksgiving, that's the qualifier, with thanksgiving, he says, when you do that, the very next verse, the peace of God. Some of you need the peace of God in your lives today. That peace of God that transcends everything, all of the understanding that you can muster up in your brain will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So if you look at the story again with me, as Jesus entered the village, this band of ten lepers, they sought him out. Word had already reached them that this itinerant miracle worker who had been traveling from village to village had cured a single leper in a village not too far from their own. And as a group, back in verse 13, they approached him with the words, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And what does Jesus do in verse 14? He responds and he says, go show yourselves to the priest. Go show yourselves to the priest. Jesus didn't say, you're healed, bless you, my child, or anything. He just said, go show yourselves to the priest. Now, if I came to Jesus and I wanted him to, to heal me, I would want him to do something right then, right where I'm at. Sometimes we're in the hospital and we want him to do something right there, right then. Jesus says, this isn't where you're getting your healing. It's going to come later or it's going to come through this person or through this avenue. But, but initially, what Jesus said to them, go show yourselves to the priests, that might sound strange. But the fact is, is that the priests of that day were also the public health officials. Did you know that? So that would be like me being the, the St. Lucie County public health official and your pastor, right? I'm not qualified really to do both, but, you know, that's what they did then. The priests were the public health officials. And if a person had been cured from a disease, an infectious disease, they had to go and present themselves to the priest. And they had to go present themselves to the priest so that they could receive their, certi their health certificate, a clean bill of health. So that everybody, like if everybody said, oh, that man was a leper, they could pull out their health certificate and say, no, look, the priest said I'm good. The priest said I'm clean, right? So they had to present themselves to the priest. And, and so the, the lepers, they would have been puzzled by this, right? Because Jesus tells them, go present yourselves to the priest. But they're looking at their skin and they're, they're like, wait, there's still a problem here. You want us to go see the priest. We're not going to be able to get within 50 yards of the priest because there's a problem. So to say that what Jesus said to them was premature for them would have been an understatement. Why bother to go get a health certificate if you haven't been cured? Yet, what did they do? They believed his words and they did as he commanded. They did exactly what Jesus told them to do. Sometimes we say, God, why haven't you healed me? God, why haven't you fixed this situation? God, why haven't you delivered me from this? And, and God's looking down saying, look, I told you what to do. You just didn't like the order, and you're not obeying me. And since you haven't obeyed me, you haven't received the blessing yet. Since you haven't obeyed me, you haven't received the healing yet. Since you haven't obeyed me, you haven't received the answer that you're looking for yet. God says, when you obey me and you do as I've commanded, then you'll get your answer. And it might not be the answer you even want, but God says, I will answer because he always answers in his time, in his way. So they believed his words, and they did as, as he commanded. And I don't really know how to explain what happened next or, how it, or explain how it happened, but the fact is, is that as these ten lepers were on their way to go see the priest, something happened to them. The numbness began to pass. Those sores that were open on their skin and the scarred hands and the scarred faces, it, it all began to vanish. And their strength began to return. And Luke simply words it this way in verse 14. It says, and as they went, they were cleansed. They were cleansed. As they obeyed the command of Christ, their longing for healing had finally come. And at this point, you would think, we don't even have to finish the story because we're sure we know how it ends, right? The cured men, they go running back to Jesus and they say, blessed healer, great physician, praise be to Jesus, right? Thank you for he healing us. Thank you for curing us. But no, that's not how the evangelist tells the story at all. Nine of the ten were never heard from again. Nine of the ten lepers that were healed were never heard from again. What a sad revelation of human nature. What ingratitude. We say, surely this isn't typical. This can't be the picture of 90% of, pe of the people in the world. But then again, we now live in a world in which there are now more hungry people than there were people in the world's population 100 years ago. 
Think about that. There are more hungry people in the world right now than there were people in the world 100 years ago. And according to a Gallup poll, nine out of every 10 Americans, American families this Thanksgiving will not stop to pray before they sit down at their Thanksgiving dinner. Nine out of 10. Jesus goes on in verse 17. When the one guy comes back to him, he says, we're not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And as I read this, I thought to myself, are we really that much unlike those other nine? Sometimes I can't help but wonder. Sometimes God gives us our answer. God gives us our healing. God gives us our deliverance. God, God provides for us in, in miraculous ways. And, and we go about our business like the other nine, and we fail to be like the one, the 10%, who go back to God and say, thank you. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for keeping your word. Thank you for keeping your promise that you'll never leave me, you'll never forsake me, and that you'll deliver me from all my troubles. We live in a world that takes everything for granted, and so it's easy for all of us, including myself, to get caught up in that ingratitude like the other nine. So we come to the last point, number three. Even in the midst of your excitement, don't forget the source of your blessings. Even in the midst of your excitement, God, thank you for getting me out of this jam. God, thank you for providing for the bill that I couldn't pay for. And God, th even in the midst of your excitement, don't forget the source. And the good news from this story is that there was one who returned. There was one who in the midst of his, his excitement, I can go back to my family now. I can go back to my kids now. I can go back to worshiping in the temple now. In the midst of his excitement, he didn't forget the source of his healing. Verse 15, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. It's a spectacular ending to the story. If you look at the percentages, it's a powerful picture of man's ingratitude, but a more powerful portrait of thanksgiving if you look at that one grateful leper. This enduring image of that one grateful leper reminds us to choose the better way. There's one last lesson that we see in this passage. I didn't put it there on your notes, but you can write something if you feel like you want to write something. It's a little bit of irony that kind of gets inserted at the end. If you look back at verse 16, it says that the man threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And what's after the little, I don't know if it has a dash there or not, but it, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. He, he, the, the other guys, as far as we know, were Jews. But this Samaritan, who Jesus shouldn't have even been talking to, who Jesus shouldn't have even been associating with, this other guy comes back and he says, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for healing me. The ones who, who you would think would have been thanking Jesus, the Jews, the, the brothers, the like-minded ones, they didn't even bother to come back. It was the half-breed, the outcast, the Gentile, the one who was considered unholy from the get-go. He's the one that came back, and in that moment, he showed just how holy his heart was. He expressed his gratitude, and to this man, Christ not only and Christ gave not only a physical blessing, but he gave him a spiritual blessing as well. If you look at verses 18 through 19, it says, Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Verse 19, Then he said to him, Jesus, the Jew, said to the Samaritan, a Gentile, Rise and go, your what? Faith has made you well. Rise and go, your faith has made you well. Nothing that he did... No strength or power of his own. It was his faith alone in Jesus Christ that saved him. It was his faith alone that made him well. The other nine, like I said, some believe were probably all Jews. They had been freed from the misery of leprosy, but they were still in bondage to the misery of ingratitude. Are you in bondage to the misery of ingratitude this morning? I am convinced that this small footnote in this story is there to remind us that God's salvation is for all people, not just the Jews. God's salvation is for everyone outside these doors, not just the precious few in here. And we should be doing something about that. We should be telling others about that. 
His salvation is for everyone. And for that, we should throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus and we should give thanks. I'll close with this story and we've got a short video. In the book, A Window on, a Mount, on the Mountain, A Window on the Mountain, it's a book by Winston Pierce and he tells of his high school class reunion. A group of the old classmates were reminiscing about things and persons that they were grateful for. One man mentioned that he was particularly thankful for Mrs. Wint. For she, more than anyone, had introduced him to Tennyson, Tennyson and the, the beauty of poetry. And acting on a suggestion, the man wrote a letter of appreciation to his former teacher and addressed it to the high school. The note was forwarded and eventually found the old teacher. About a month later, the man received a response. <clears throat> and it was written in feeble longhand. And, and read as follows, My dear Willie, I can't tell you how much your letter meant to me. I am now in my 90s living alone in a small room, cooking my own meals, lonely and like the last leaf of a of fall lingering behind. You will be interested to know that I taught school for 40 years and yours is the first letter of appreciation I ever received. It came on a blue, cold morning and it cheered me as nothing has for years. Willie, you have made my day. Don't be like the other nine. Take the time to say thanks, not only to God, but to those who have helped you along the way, to those who have poured into your life, to those who have spoken into your life. I know I've messaged many of my former teachers from high school even on Facebook just to say thanks. And they always write back and they always say, you made my day. Or I didn't know I had that impact on you. Or I'm so glad to see what God's done with your life now. And so take the time. Don't be like the other nine. Be like the one, the 10%. We should be the 10%. The church should be the 10% that goes back and says thank you to God for the blessings that he's given us. Take a look at the screen and we'll be Thanksgiving done. season. Let us remember to give thanks before Thanksgiving begins. Remember the words of Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, not some of the time, always. Pray continually, not just in the morning, not just in the afternoon, not just in the evening. Pray continually. Other versions say pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. Why? Because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Paul could say this better than anybody. He had been beaten. He had been imprisoned. He had been spit on. He had been stoned. And he says, through it all, rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all all circumstances, because this is God's will for each and every one of you in Christ Jesus. It's the will of God to give thanks, Paul said. And I would venture to say today that some of us, if we're being honest, are long overdue in giving thanks to God for what he has done in our lives. And so I would challenge you this morning to take time today or take time this week sometime to sit down and make your own list. Make your own list of the many things that you have to be thankful for. And don't be like the other nine that never returned. Make the list. Take time to return to God and give him thanks for all that he has done. Pray with me, if you will. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, we know that it shouldn't take a single day out of the year called Thanksgiving to remind us to be thankful. Because your word tells us that we're to be thankful and give thanks in all circumstances at all times. Lord Jesus, if we're honest this morning, as we talk to you, we would have to confess that too many times we're like the other nine. We take the blessing, we take the answers, we take the healing, and we just run with it. And we so often forget to come back and say thanks. Lord Jesus, this week, I pray that you'll help heighten our awareness to the fact that you are a good, good Father and that you love us and that every good and perfect gift comes from our Heavenly Father above. I pray that you'll help us to take time to sit down 
even in the midst of our trouble, even in the midst of our sorrow, even in the midst of our hurt and our pain, whatever it might be that we're facing, and make that list of all the good things that you've given us. Help us this week, Lord, to focus on being thankful for the blessings in our lives, even the trials, Lord, that teach us so much about who you are, how much you love us, and how you'll never leave us and forsake us if we just keep our eyes focused on you, Lord. Help us to be thankful this week. Lord Jesus, I'm thankful for today. I'm thankful for what you did on the cross for me and for each and every person here today. Lord, thank you that it's nothing that I've done, but it's all because of what you did on the cross for each and every one of us. I'm thankful for that today. I'm thankful for the hope and the future that you give me and my family and each and every person sitting here when they place their faith and trust in you and make you the Lord of their lives. Lord, be with us this week as we celebrate with our families. I pray that you'll help us to remember to be thankful and help us to share that with our families and help us to point our families towards being thankful as well. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys. We love you. Have a great week. Can't wait to see you next weekend as we kick off our Christmas season. God bless.